Hey, this is Dominic, and this is your home for the cutting edge conversations on optimizing your personal performance, lighting up your sex life, and living a purpose driven life of your own design. These are the topics that Dominic and I have both struggled with in our own lives and still don't always get right. This is Brian. Welcome to the Great Man Podcast. What's up, fellas? I'm really pumped about today's episode regarding the seven habits of a mentally tough man because it's also an invitation for you, an invitation to join me, Brian, and a group of other great men from around the world to do our first ever Mentally Tougher Man Challenge. Now, starting on January 1st, 2021, and for each of the 31 days of that month, we will email and or text you a daily challenge drawn from these seven habits that you'll hear Brian and I talk about on today's episode that will test and enhance your mental toughness. In our conversation today, Brian and I outline each of these seven habits, one for each day of the week, which you'll be performing in an effort to string together 31 consecutive days of wins. We're doing this to help you build mental toughness habits and also to kickstart 2021 with power and intention. And I don't know about you guys, but the way that 2020 has played out for many of us, we could use a strong start to 2021. So for example, and spoiler alert, one of the challenges is a cold shower, which you'll be doing on the very first day of 2021. So you'll be doing on January 1st, a week later on January 8th, on January 15th, and so on. Another one is going to be meditation, which you'll be doing on January 2nd, January 9th, January 16th. You get the point. Each day of the week has a different theme, like the cold shower, the meditation, and then each week we ratchet it up a little bit, make it a little bit more challenging. And we've got some really cool special guests who are going to be delivering some of this content. For example, Corey Mascara, who we've had on the show a number of times to lead us through meditation who wrote the fantastic book, Stop Missing Your Life, he's going to be providing the weekly meditations, guided meditations to help you along your journey. He's doing that in an effort to support your mental well-being. So as we see it, becoming a mentally and emotionally tougher man has three very clear benefits. Number one, it gives you the ability to maintain your power and integrity in the worst of moments. God knows we've had plenty of worst moments this year in 2020. Number two, becoming a mentally and emotionally tougher man gives you the ability to turn any challenge into a training ground for improvement. And as you'll hear Brian and I talk about in this episode, men who don't have a foundation of inner work, who don't have inner structures around building mental and emotional toughness really suffered this year. But the men who had started doing work on building mental and emotional toughness saw this year not just as tough, but as a training ground to improve the most important areas of your life. And then finally, number three, becoming a mentally and emotionally tougher man gives you the ability to go after bigger things in your life. Because going after bigger things requires bigger challenges, bigger risk of failure, bigger risk of being criticized. And when you are mentally and emotionally tougher, you can handle those bigger risks. So, With all of that at stake, why would you not join us on this journey? You'll also have built-in accountability with daily email and or text support, as well as you're going to have the online community of men from around the world doing this challenge in our men's only Facebook group, which is called the Great Man Within Podcast Facebook group. I'm linking that in the show notes. So register now for this challenge at thegreatmanwithin.com. It's in the show notes, wherever you're watching, you're listening to your podcast right now, thegreatmanwithin.com. You can register for this challenge. Oh, and we've decided to make this challenge free as our gift to you to help you start 2021 strong. Enjoy today's episode, Seven Habits of a Mentally Tough Man, and we'll see you in the challenge. So Brian, I just asked you if you were ready to record and you're like, I'm feeling the flow. Let's get this thing going. I am feeling the flow today. I'm setting high expectations for this podcast. (laughs) What has got you so riled up today? One 
last weekend we had an immersion with our mastermind that was awesome. I know we're going to talk a little bit about that. And coming on the heels of that, I feel like what's becoming clearer and clearer to me is this vision that has been fuzzy for a couple of years. And now it's coming into, into sight. And I'm really excited about that. And more specifically to right now, we just did Wim Hof breathing. <laughs> and I haven't done that for a few days. And I feel elated. Yeah, you look lit up right now, man. So I mean, you said about the mastermind. It was it was a special weekend this past weekend because we finally had a chance in the in the mastermind to get a part of the group together in person. You know, we were supposed to do our first in person immersion in May. Had to cancel that. We were planning on doing something in August. Had to cancel that. And then back in September, we decided, hey, it looks like we have the opportunity with some testing protocols, and you own. A testing company, Vahila, which you know you contract out with a lot of the Hollywood production studios, like Dancing with the Stars and others. So back in September, we made that decision. Hey, like a group of us are going to get together. If the men, you know, find it prudent, we're going to use your testing protocol. So as we're recording this in late November, we ended up having about half the group show up in person. We did the other half the group in virtual. You had to make the tough decision. Like I think what three or four days before we left that you were going to stay behind and do it virtually. What was, yes. what was the reason for that, man? Yeah. So I am considered someone with a pre-existing condition. I've gone through cancer, gone through chemotherapy. Also, my blood type has a little bit higher risk of worse outcomes for COVID positive patients. And I felt with the spike in active infections right now, it just didn't make a lot of sense for me. Yeah. And so, yes, that means the guy that was in charge of the COVID testing protocols and safety didn't go, <laughs> um, but it wasn't because I thought that those protocols weren't right. It was simply because I didn't want to take that risk personally. What was really cool about this mastermind was that you know men like you, there was a number of guys who had to make a similar decision as you. Other guys were parents or divorced parents where you know the quarantining restrictions just would have made it, you know, it, it would have made it unreasonable for them to go was just how understanding and compassionate and supportive every guy in the group was for each man, no matter what the situation was. And, you know, I've been a part of many men's groups. When I say men's groups, I don't mean like men's work groups. I mean, groups of men, whether it was in sport, fraternity, sales forces and and companies. Or just buddies. Or buddies, right? Where it's like, if one guy has a situation that's different than the rest, he oftentimes gets like belittled or ostracized for making that decision like, hey, my marriage isn't so great right now. I can't come. Don't be a pussy. Come on. Like this is what you – and like that guy ends up feeling like he's not part of the group. And in this situation, we really made made an intentional focus to honor every guy no matter where he was. And we were going to make each man as much of a part of that experience as possible. So we ended up having like you know, the in-person guys. There was 10 of us. And then we had like two cameras that we brought. So you could see me teaching and then the rest of the room kind of like if you were virtual, you get a chance to see everyone else. And like I know, I know you said that it felt like you were a part of the immersion as much as you could be from you know the comfort of your own home. It was great. If you're listening to this podcast right now and you're thinking about doing a five-hour Zoom call as part of the immersion, it sounds awful. I would not – if somebody introduced me to that and said, do you want to do an immersion for five hours over Zoom? I'd say no. That sounds like <laughs> crap. But this – I felt like I was there. I felt like I was with the group. It didn't feel separate. It didn't feel different. And I didn't know going into that whether that would be the case or not or whether I'd be feeling fidgety. So I think a lot of the intentions that were set prior to in terms that we're going to be working on courage and what that looks like, the interactions that we had with the guys individually in small group, I mean, it just made the time fly by. Well, you just mentioned the word courage, which is, is it's a great lead in for a conversation today about seven habits of a mentally tougher man. And again, this conversation today is kind of an overview and a lead up to how we're going to be starting January with the Mentally Tougher Man Challenge. For every day of the month of January, we're going to be having a group of men go through a series of daily challenges that take anywhere between three minutes to upwards of 20 minutes so that we can fortify our inner foundation to become mentally tougher men. And just as a table setter for this conversation today, why this matters, why it's important, In the mastermind, like the immersion, the theme was courage. The reason why courage matters is because every guy listening to this show wants something more for his life. Bottom line, right? He wants to discover and live the great man within him. And living a life of greatness means you're going to be playing bigger games in your life. You're going to be having bolder visions. You're going to be stepping up into bigger challenges. 
right? Like you're going to be facing bigger fears, limiting beliefs, inner critic stories. And as a result of all of that, you need new skills, new tools to fortify your inner foundation, those inner structures that allow you to navigate some of the resistance that you're going to be facing in the external world. Let's also not forget that 2020 has been one of the most challenging years that any of us have ever experienced with a global pandemic, with the external world stripping away a lot of your comforts or securities or predictabilities. And we have seen a division between men who have done inner work and men who don't have a foundation of inner work and how those two categories of men have responded this year. For most men who have not had a foundation of inner work, and it's not a fault of theirs, we're not judging them, but this has been an abnormally challenging year for that group. For the guys who have a foundation of inner work, we've seen men use this year as a training ground to get stronger, more powerful, to make big changes that have been needing to be made in their lives. You and I can both attest to that, right? I, I completely changed my business, letting go of corporate so I can focus 100% on 10 million men. And you, at the beginning of this year, felt like a failure in your entrepreneurial ventures, started a business that you couldn't have even conceived of before this year with the COVID testing. And now, like you've recently shared with me before this episode, that in three and a half months of business, you guys are thriving and not only thriving, like, but you've banked a, a considerable profit in the first three months, which is unheard of in a startup venture. And yet, I think you said before we started recording, without this inner work foundation, you don't think you would have gotten your business up to running with this kind of level of success as quickly as you have. It takes uh, a path less traveled to make some of the decisions that it takes to, to run a business or to have a really intimate relationship or all these things that we want in our lives. And we are programmed from a very early age to follow a path, to deviate and to create more in our lives. We need an interrupt. We need something that brings a new awareness to us so that we can make a choice, that we can make a decision as opposed to just living out our lives, right? We call that drift on this show. And these are the tools that we're going to go through today that help us practice so that when real life happens, we're ready and we can make decisions and move in a different direction and reprogram what our patterns are. Hell yes. Hell yes. So we're the ones who are consciously interrupting our patterns versus waiting for an outside force like a pandemic. Right. Because it will happen. It's going to happen. A, a, illness, a <laughs> pandemic, a financial situation, somebody pisses you off on the corner of the street. These things happen. The question is, what do we do with it, right? Do we follow that same pattern or do we have a choice that we want to do? And, and again, the difference between men who have a foundation of inner work and those who don't is that like when that thing happens that you don't want, the men who don't have an inner, that, that don't have that inner foundation of, of inner work, they look at this as this is not supposed to happen. Why me? Why the pandemic? Why this? Why that? And get consumed with that narrative. And that's the division you're talking about. Yes. Right? It's like, are we living in a victimhood mentality? Not the things that outside are changing, but the mentality is, this isn't okay. We need to change it. Or is it one of ownership, of, of not even ownership, of just seeing what is and being with that? And then, great, now let's make decisions. Yeah. And it's like, got it. Okay. There's adversity here. Let's face it. I mean, you and I were both athletes, right? Back in the day, like when you were a baseball player and you were like, there was a game where you went down by seven runs early in the game because maybe like the, the shortstop kicks a ball and there's an error or whatever, we're not hitting. You're not sitting there kind of like sulking in the, why is this happening? Why is this happening? You get up and you play the game. You manufacture runs, you make sure, whatever. So this is what we're talking about. And when we're talking about building mental toughness, what we're really talking about is both mental and emotional toughness. You develop this ability to avoid collapsing when things don't go your way, when things get hard, you don't just throw in the towel, right? Like mentally and emotionally tougher men step forward into adversity. And it also shows you the ability to maintain your power in adverse situations. Like other guys get rocked and feel like they're less than, but when you see a tough situation, when a pandemic showed up, man, like. At first, I let myself sulk a little when the pandemic happened and I saw like my keynote speeches and my corporate contracts starting to get canceled. I sulked a little bit at first, but then I was like, okay, this is a battle I've never faced before. Let's see what I'm made of. You know, and then all of a sudden I got to, I got to put a smile on my face and see what would happen. And then that birthed new things like I did daily podcasts and then I reconfigured my business and then I got to throw more time and energy into the mastermind and do, you know, and that made the year feel 
much more in, in my control than out of my control. This is from our friend and coach, John O'Connor. But he talks about when situations arise like that, looking at it. And the track that I have in my head now is I look at it and I go, huh, isn't that interesting? Yes. Isn't it interesting that we have a pandemic right now? Isn't it interesting <laughs> that I'm getting I'm getting yelled at by the person in front of me? Isn't it interesting? Huh. It provides an opening for a choice of how to feel, a choice of what to do. It's a reframe, you know, versus like being commanded or dragged around by the wild horses of your brain saying this is bad, this is wrong, it shouldn't be happening. So right. we're going to be talking about seven habits of mentally tougher men. And for men who have listened to this show, I can't imagine that many of these habits will be brand new to you. You, you have heard us talk about a lot of these before, but we're going to be bringing different angles, different perspectives, and different practices to how you can apply these. So if you're a long-term listener, there's absolutely new stuff in here for you. And for those of you who are newer listeners, welcome aboard. Some of these things may be new to you. So each of these practices that we're about to talk about habits will represent a habit that is going to be going into each day of, of the 31 day challenge in the month of January, right? The mentally tougher man challenge. The way we've structured it is like each Monday has a theme, Tuesday has a theme, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then that theme repeats itself each week. And what we're about to go into is what each day looks like. And just to be clear, Dominic structured this, not Brian, because I would not have included cold showers in the mentally tougher Boom. man. <laughs> <laughs> challenge. <laughs> but clearly this is architected by Dominic. Well, Brian, you just talked about challenge number one or habit number one, which is happening on January 1st, which I think is that Friday, right? Of course it is. Yes. Great. The cold shower. So cold showers have some scientific evidence behind them showing that when you jump into a cold shower, it provides better blood circulation because what ends up happening is when your body feels cold, it sends blood to all of the vital organs in your system. It moves away from its extremities, right? So like you'll feel colder in your fingertips and your toes because the blood is rushing to those vital organs like liver, heart, kidney, stomach, which is very valuable for those parts of your body. And also cold showers have been shown to, I think, release some sort of hormones in the brain that like lead to uh, mood enhancers. For me personally, I know that like when I do a, a one minute to three minute cold shower at the end of my hot shower, I walk out of the shower feeling upbeat, optimistic, energized, even before I've had my coffee. And so, okay. So you do hot water to begin with. Yep. I know this differs, but how long is a cold shower for afterwards? My habit has been like most days it's one minute of cold at the end. Okay. And when we're talking like winter time here, cold showers hit different in the winter than they do when it's like. May. And you don't, like, you don't do hot water after the cold water? You just you leave after the cold water? I do leave, but if you follow someone like Ben Greenfield, who's a biohacking freak, he likes to say the cold, hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, go back and forth because the hot shower dilates your blood vessels. So there's like a lot more opportunity for things to flow through. Cold sends the blood racing to your system. So while the – like you just had dilated blood vessels – Cold will send the blood faster through. So that's like, it creates an opening out of faster flow. So the back and forth is really beneficial. That's why, you know, in, in spas, they say sauna to cold plunge, sauna to cold plunge, sauna to cold plunge. You can replicate that in your shower. Got it. Okay, cool. I think the nuance here, the benefit of this is you really get to appreciate that hot shower even more so yes, than, you do. than you already do. So I think the way we're going to structure this is like the first Friday that we do this on January 1st, it's like 15 seconds cold shower. And then the next week, it'll be like 30 seconds cold shower, then 45. And then I think it'll be like, do the whole shower cold. So walk in dry as a bone and like go right into the cold shower. So we're going to ramp it up each week. Yep. That sounds awful. <laughs> and it works. I, I got to say, this is one of the ones that I really, I really dislike. But when I'm in a place where I need to be ready to go. I need some energy. I will hop in that cold shower because it does work. Absolutely. So that's habit number one. Let's go into habit number two of the mentally tougher man, which is going to be meditation. So meditation is something that has, in my mind, in my life, become a superpower. I used to be a person when I sat down in a chair for one minute to calm my breathing and to like focus my mind, that felt like a punishment to me. And that was about eight years ago where I first sat down to meditate as a part of my Sex Addicts Anonymous recovery program and protocol. 
was to get present and to bring stillness to my hyperactive mind. And for any man who's ever considered it or who's tried meditation and then given up on it because like you can't quiet your mind, I think one of the biggest fallacies that I would want to overcome for a beginner is, Corey Mascara taught me this, the practice of meditation is not to eliminate thoughts in your mind. It's almost impossible because your mind's job is to produce thoughts. That's what it does. But it's to be able to witness your thoughts non-judgmentally being the practice of meditation. What does that feel like for you as you hear that, Bri? Dominic, for me, it's a place to go for clarity. And I can tell when I'm in a habit of doing it versus when I'm not. When I'm not doing it, I feel the world is sped up, but I'm moving slower. Yeah. The opposite of when I'm in a meditation practice is the world feels like it's moving slower and I'm in more control. And to give you just like a couple examples of this, I was in Italy with Becca and we were on a boat coming from the island of Capri over to Positano. It was raining. It was rough. We were on the inside cabin of this big taxi boat and people were puking and moaning and it was awful. I had the ability because I had developed this over a period of time to drop in, to drop into a meditation in a place like that. Not just to avoid what was beyond me, but to say like, ha, this is an interesting time that I can do this. And man, like I left that boat of puking and storms. And this one, we got back to Positano feeling light on my feet, <laughs> feeling energized, like feeling like, great, like what's next? That's right. We can get a piece of that regardless of what's around us every single day. Yeah. You know, you're making me think of Viktor Frankl's quote about in between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space lies our ability to make new choices. And those new choices are the gateways to, to freedom, right? In our lives. Now, you just talked about creating space between that stimulus and response through the meditation because you could have just as easily succumbed to all the nausea and all the worry and all the whatever. I think back to the beginning of the pandemic when all of a sudden I started seeing my speeches getting canceled, my workshops getting canceled. I mean, I basically built my entire business model around in person activities. And then all of a sudden we started to see like for the foreseeable future, that's not going to happen. And I had just hired a full-time employee February 18th or something like that, right? The beginning of the pandemic. And I remember feeling that fear, which I could have allowed to take hold of me and driven all of my decisions from, I could have allowed that to happen. So I could have been making fear-based decisions with respect to my business and my life. But I sat down at the very beginning of the pandemic, dropped into meditation felt that fear, allowed it to consume me, asked it what its messages were for me. And at the end of it, I came out of that with a new sense of clarity and calm to say, okay, there are some things that I should be afraid of. Here are my strategies to deal with that. And also there's a lot of this nebulous fear that I was able to clear out and make decisions about my business that came from a place of resourcefulness. So meditation can be a superpower in that respect. And I'm holding Corey Mascara's book here called Stop Missing Your Life, How to Be Deeply Present in an Unpresent World. We've had him on the show a few times. He's a meditation teacher that's you know, really big uh, like globally. And his book was released earlier this year. And he says something pretty profound. He said, I don't care about meditation and neither should you. Right, this is a meditation teacher talking. He said, these days, a big part of what I do is teaching mindfulness meditation. Most of the people I have the privilege of working with come to me to learn this practice. And it's why they're caught off guard when I tell them I don't actually care about meditation. Evidenced by their nervous laugh that fades into a, wait, are you serious? And yes, it's true. I don't care about meditation. In fact, I've never cared about meditation despite some of my life-changing stories that I've shared. I care about things like truth, wholeness, happiness, peace, Wisdom, compassion, love, and connection. All of these things that come with presence. That's where my heart, my passion, and my interest lie, not in meditation. It just so happens that meditation has been the most powerful and effective way for me to get those things. So that's what we're talking about here is if you want truth about what's your purpose in life, if you want wholeness, meaning you feel complete and happy about the life that you're living, fully self-expressed. If you want happiness, peace, and wisdom, meditation ends up being one of the most powerful practices to get And in meditation for Corey, it works. For Dominic, it works. For Brian, it works. It doesn't work. And he's the first one to say that it doesn't work for everyone. 
And that's one of the reasons we have seven challenges that we're doing, because each of these play with an element of mindfulness, of setting your routine, doing it, executing, and then seeing the benefits, seeing the rewards from each of these seven challenges. Yes. And it's been shown, Bri, that different meditation practices land with different people. There are some people who love a chanting meditation, like you have a mantra that you just chant inside your head. For me, that doesn't do much. But I love visualizations. I love focusing on my breath work. Some people hate focusing on their breath. It drives them crazy. Some people like guided meditations. Other people don't want any voice whatsoever. When you find your rhythm, that's where you want to double down on. You can start to pick and choose, discard the ones that aren't working for you. And then the ones that are, just build the practice around it, which is why in this 31-day Mentally Tougher Man Challenge, Corey has graciously offered to do the weekly meditations. So we're probably going to send it out via text message and email, like a three to five to 10 minute different versions of guided meditations that he'll offer up so that you can start to pick and choose what works for you. Yeah. And and if you don't like Corey's voice, you're not human. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) Guy's voice is angelic. Everyone likes Corey. It's difficult to be a person that everyone likes. Corey's that guy. I haven't met a single person that just like is like, nah, that guy's not my cup of tea. I know. I wish I could say something bad about the guy, but I really can't. It's very challenging too. Yeah, he's a, he's a peaceful human. Hey, just a quick pause on this interview to remind you to take this opportunity now to register for the 31-day Mentally Tougher Man Challenge to kickstart 2021. We know that sometimes when you listen to these episodes, your workout ends or you get a phone call or you get interrupted and you forget to come back to the episode This is your time to make sure that that doesn't happen. In the show notes at the very top, you can go to thegreatmanwithin.com, register for the 31-day challenge, and then go right back to listening. All right, number three, the third habit of a mentally tougher man is breath work. Now, breath work is something that Brian and I came across like two, three years ago when we were at this event called A-Fest, and we met the immortal Wim Hof, right, the Iceman, who could use breath work to stabilize his inner body temperature to be like 97.8. What was it? 98.7 or 97.8 degrees? I don't know, man. All I know is this guy would jump in ice lakes and swim underneath the ice. And he put his body in a state that could do that. So not that I want to do that. That's worse than a cold shower. But the fact that he can do that, like to be able to change his metabolic structure, let's just call it that, through breath work was insane. That was a mind blower. Before, like, you know, he and a number of others who have really taken breath work to the extreme, before they were able to show that they were able to regulate their autonomic nervous system, science believed that we didn't have any control over our autonomic nervous system. It's called autonomic for a reason, right? That it's automatic, that we breathe automatically, right? It's it's not something that we have control over, but Wim Hof, yogis, Breathwork practitioners have shown that you can slow your heart rate, raise your heart rate, control your body temperature, control your stress levels, change your heart rate variability metrics, all based on your breath. What Brian and I love about breathwork are the very practical applications around reducing anxiety and navigating stress, using breathwork practices to help you fall asleep at night, using breathwork practices to help you wake up in the morning and activate. So Brian, you've got two or three different practical applications for breathwork that you want to go through. So what are those categories and what are the breathwork exercises? Yeah. Think about these different exercises, different practices of breathwork as tools to use in different circumstances. So we have some breathwork, like the Wim Hof breathwork, for example, that's to energize. Like if I want to wake up and I want to go kind of like the cold shower, that's a, a Wim Hof hyperventilating, really getting a ton of oxygen into your system, right? That's that's the first one. And how does that? How would that work? Like, how would you describe what that one is? The actual techniques. Yeah, the technique of doing Wim Hof. Yeah, it's forty breaths, fully in, and then letting go at about eighty percent, fully in, letting go, and doing that for yeah for forty breaths, and then letting go of all the air at the end and holding. And some people can hold for 30 seconds with empty lungs. Some people can hold for four minutes. Some people can do more than that. But just noticing, I think this is the the beauty of this exercise is it's not just like what are the benefits I get afterwards, but it's what we're noticing in the time that we're holding our breaths. We can feel our heart rate change. We can feel the body of our temperature change. We can recognize where our mind is going. 
And it's a great exercise. I like to do this pre-meeting. So I'll notice before a meeting, I'm like, oh, I'll notice that I'm anxious, that I'm stressed about what's about to happen in the meeting. The only reason I can notice that is because I have some level of emotional fluency and I meditate. <laughs> Otherwise, I would have been like, I, well, this is how I feel. So first of all, I notice it. Second of all, I have the tool to do something with it. So instead of denying it, I can like, great, let's do some Wim Hof breath work. And for me, that allows me to get past it and to have the energy and the excitement to go into the meeting. Yeah, with the Zoom meetings now, like you couldn't have done that maybe if like we were in the offices, but now you could do it on Zoom because before you jump on a call, no one sees you, you're in your own room. It takes like two minutes to do a Wim Hof breath work like that. So right. that's an activating one. What's the next one? So the next one is uh, if you want to focus. So if we're feeling, like, let's say at midday, we're feeling a bit chaotic, we've got a bunch of different things on our plate to just take a moment and work through a focused uh, breathing exercise. So a focused breathing exercise, one that we do in the mastermind, it's called box breathing. This one's super popular. Yeah. Super popular, super simple. I know some NBA basketball teams use this, but box breathing is really simple. Think about it like a box. Let's call it a four second box breath. It's four seconds in, a four second hold, a four second breathe out, a four second hold, and then you repeat. Nice. And that's the box. And so that one, you do four or five rounds of that. And all of a sudden you're like zoned in. It's like, great. Okay. Like now we're, now we're ready to go. It's unbelievable how fast that shifts your physiology. That's why the Navy SEALs popularize the box breathing because it's, it activates both your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. Sympathetic nervous system is the go mode. It's time to get down to business. The parasympathetic nervous system is rest and digest. That's the relaxation. And if you can be both focused and relaxed at the same time, that's where we make some of the best decisions. That's where we end up ending in an alpha brainwave state, creative function, everything's get easier. So box breathing is fantastic. And like Brian said, you only need to do a few cycles, two, three minutes of it, and you can feel the benefits of it. Think about this. These are people that are performing. This is not a time to practice. This is a time to perform. NBA basketball players, Navy SEALs, life's on the line, right? These are the exercises that people that are ready to perform and need to perform and execute are doing. Hell yeah. What's the last one? So the last purpose of breath work that we're talking about here is to relax. Oftentimes, I use this one when I go to bed. I got a million things going on in my mind, but I need to go to sleep so I can wake up refreshed the next day. And this one is called four, seven, eight breathing. This is almost as simple. Actually, it's probably more simple than the box breathing, but it's really simple. It's four seconds in through the nose, hold for seven seconds, exhale through the mouth for eight seconds. No stopping at either end and just repeat that. So four in, seven hold, eight out. And I get through usually a maximum of two to three rounds of that before I'm fast asleep. Wow. It's that fast for you? That fast. Wow. Last night, I was laying next to Becca and I was so excited about today because I got a lot of like really fun things, including this podcast that I'm doing today. I, I just put my laptop away. So I was like, my brain was still fully on. And I was like, I'm so excited. I'm not tired at all. And, and she was like, asleep by the time I said that. So I think I got through two and a half rounds of 478 breathing. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and 478 breathing, like, we, we, we got introduced to this by Dr. Miles Spar, who's been on a guest on the show a couple of times, and he's also in the mastermind. And he, he tells this story about how like he was about to go on stage with another presenter, and that presenter started having a literal heart attack, and they laid him down, and they made him do 478 breathing to calm his nervous system, and it worked. So you know, breathwork has the power and I know a number of people who have struggled with like anxiety disorders who say that breathwork practices have saved their lives. You know, like four, seven, eight breathing or box breathing help to short circuit that trajectory of panic attacks or anxiety or when you're having a panic attack, being able to use those breathwork techniques to bring it back down. I do this in real time, Dom. If I'm having an argument with someone, if I have something that pops up within business, I notice that I'm not breathing or I'm yeah. breathing very shallowly. Shallowly? Is that? That's a shallowly. Word. Uh, shallowly. Got it. Nailed it. But it's helpful in those moments to even just take one breath. To take one full breath, it helps me listen, helps me hone in on what's present versus like all the other things that are happening around. So it's powerful even in these moments. And that's why we practice it. That's why it's part of the challenge. Again, like why you want to become a mentally tougher man is it allows you to maintain your integrity and strength in the eye of the storm. 
And how many guys like lose their shit when someone triggers them or they say things that they just, or another way, this is, this is how it used to manifest with me. When tensions got high, I would clam up. Like I would shut down because like, I'd be so nervous in the inside. I wouldn't, I wouldn't trust myself to speak with power. So I would bite my tongue and someone else would like steamroll me. But with these breath work techniques, I can slow my breathing in the moment and then go toe to toe with someone with a, in a really powerful way. It's a superpower. It's nothing short of a superpower. So habit number four of a mentally tougher man is reading powerful men's literature, okay? So reading powerful men's literature that help you to define who you want to be as a man, make you think differently, more deeply about some of the social constructs that have defined your masculinity and then you getting to to author that yourself. I'll give you two examples. One example is from Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich. Chapter 11 is this powerful chapter. And I would just encourage you to go down. You can Google Think and Grow Rich, chapter 11, and you can find a PDF that like will give you the entire chapter for free. It's called The Mystery of Sex Transmutation. Transmutation is basically like alchemizing, basically taking one thing and then turning it into another. And I'll read to you like one excerpt from the chapter that really changed my life, especially as someone who went through Sex Addicts Anonymous. There's a section here called Why Men Seldom Succeed Before the Age of 40. So I discovered from the analysis of over 25,000 people that men who succeed in an outstanding way seldom do so before the age of 40, and more often, they do not strike their real pace until they are, are well beyond the age of 50. Just a pause here. Like He wrote this back in the 1920s, right? So some age things have changed, but a lot of this still holds true. Back to his quotes, this fact was so astounding that it prompted me to go into the study of its cause most carefully. This study disclosed the fact that the major reason why the majority of men who succeed do not begin to do so before the age of 40 to 50 is their tendency to dissipate their energies through overindulgence in physical expression of the emotion of sex. The majority of men never learn that the urge of sex has other possibilities, which far transcend in importance that of mere physical expression. The majority of those who make this discovery do so after having wasted many years at a period when the sex energy is at its height, like 20s and 30s, prior to the age of 45 to 50, but this is usually followed by noteworthy achievement. You're smiling. I'm smiling. I'm laughing. If you're a father listening to this, know that if this is something that you can teach your boy, your kid, that you will save him <laughs> decades, decades. And Dominic, I was thinking through my mind as you're reading that from the ages probably starting as young as seven all the way through, let's call it 37, <laughs> maybe more than that. I would say that I spent... 85 to 90 percent of my free time thinking about that thinking about sex totally thinking like going to bars hitting on women like dressing in certain ways being a certain way is like all for this thing called sex it there that was the the number one drive in my life that's right and when he says it can be there are other possibilities for it holy crap like that didn't even register in my mind didn't even register that like your whole life is built around or most many major decisions your life was built around securing sex. The same thing for me, man. And obviously I, you know, like my path led me to 12 step recovery program. But when I had the opportunity to interrupt that pattern and for those four years where I abstained from porn and abstained from masturbation. And then while within that window, 11 of those months, I completely abstained altogether where there was no sex whatsoever. That was the period that during those 11 months was when I found I had all this extra energy that I used to spill out or dissipate as he uses that word into Kleenexes or into, you know, sexual, empty sexual experiences. When that energy had none of those outlets anymore, I had to figure out where else to put it. And that was the exact point in time where I said, I don't want to be working in financial services anymore. I want to start my own business. I want to live a life of passion. And because I wasn't dissipating my energy, I was like, well, maybe now I could use this energy to create that thing. 
So that was exactly during the time where I made the decision to leave corporate. It was when I launched a blog. It was when I started creating versus consuming and it changed my life forever. And now learning how to harness the sexual energy, you can see like my creative life force has come back in profound ways. But that book, that passage gave me the aha moment, right? To create that mental awareness that I wouldn't have had without those words. Yeah. And to be really clear on this, we are not advocating monk-like behavior. We are advocating that this sexual energy is a creative energy and we can decide how we want to use it. That's right. And at the younger ages, and this is like a, a, a gift that we're given to feel this sort of thing, but unfortunately, we just channel it in the wrong direction. So even at these younger ages where we have these hormones and urges and everything else, great. Just know that there's a choice of what we can do with that. And there's a choice that requires building mental toughness because instead of giving into your urges, instead of jerking off anytime it's easy or anytime you feel depressed or anytime you feel lonely or stressed out, there's a new choice because now you're aware through reading this particular piece of men's work, there's an opportunity to take that energy and put it towards the things that matter most to you. I want to read you one more passage here before we move on from this section from David Data as The Way of the Superior Man. This comes in chapter eight. This is a principle that Brian and I talk about all the time in the show of leaning just beyond your edge. In any given moment, a man's growth is optimized if he leans just beyond his edge, his capacity, his fear. He should not be too lazy, happily stagnating in the zone of security and comfort, nor should he push far beyond the edge, stressing himself unnecessarily, unable to metabolize his experience. He should lean just slightly beyond the edge of fear and discomfort constantly in everything that he does. And what David Data is saying here in The Way of Superior Man is a man who knows how to step up to his edge of fear and not be reckless and think that he's stronger or more capable than he, or tougher than he actually is. And then like unable to metabolize your experience or saying yes to too many things and then collapsing under the weight of it or shrinking back from that edge. It's being meticulous with your awareness around what are my edges right now and knowing how to lean over that to push yourself further so that you can grow more deeply. That has been a guiding principle of my life for the past 10 years, ever since I've read that. And we talk about that all the time in the mastermind too. We do. Yeah. I don't know if this is an edge or not, Dominic, but something I'm recognizing is the frequency of my stress boners have gone down. And I'll explain that. I will explain that. That That's something that needs explaining. It doesn't, man. I, I know exactly what you're talking about. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. Well, yeah. We've talked about this publicly before where like what are the triggers that cause masturbating behavior? One of those for me, I would notice I'm working at home. I'm doing an email to an investor or something that's making me anxious. And all of a sudden I would get hard. Yeah. I'm like, what the hell is happening? And then, of course, like I would jerk off and then come back to it and everything else. But it was an automatic response. And when I brought awareness to that automatic response, I now have a choice. Like, oh, hello there, anxious or stress boner. Like, I'm actually going to do this email first. And if you're still around when I get back and I'm done, <laughs> then we'll take care of it. Right? <laughs> and my body, literally my physiology has changed where like that rarely happens anymore. Yeah. You, you know what's really interesting? About, first of all, I think it's awesome that you set appointments with your boners, your stress boners. Just to be <laughs> yeah. like, okay, if you're still here later. <laughs> I, you're, you're important. I love when you do this. This is amazing. I'll, I'll see you later. Dude, my whole life, my sexuality was driven by stress, anxiousness, insecurity, loneliness, fear. That was like what I brought to sex. And because I felt anxious, stressed out, lonely a lot, my sex drive was really high. But over these last like year, year and a half where I've really unwound most of that anxiousness, that inner chaos, that inner critic, I wasn't quite aware of this at the time, but I was finding my sex drive taking a dip and I couldn't quite figure out what it was. But obviously through this meditation and mindfulness practice, I was like, whoa, because I'm no longer in that inner state of chaos, the things that preempted my sexuality is gone, but now I get to choose. And it was almost like changing over from like one antiquated system to like a higher level operating system. In the temporary, it took away from my sex drive, but now the thing that fuels my sex force is my strength, my wholeness, my heart, my creativity. And so I have like a powerful sex drive now, but it's not preempted by fear, nervousness, or insecurity anymore in the way that it used to. And that's that's an upgrade. You've gone from stress boners to 
Love boners. I don't know. Love boners. <laughs> That's nice. Power boners. Kingly boners, you know? Kingly boners. All right. So let's let's make our way through these last few. So we just talked about reading. Moving on to the next one is the fifth habit of a mentally tougher man is journaling. Okay. So journaling creates introspective moments, gives you an opportunity to think about your thinking. Like another term for that is metacognition. Some people have thoughts, but they don't recognize that you can think about your thoughts. You can observe your thoughts. We just gave you two amazing passages that if you were to read, you can actually write about that. You can journal, wow, how have I used my sexual energy up to this point? And what would I like to, if I were to transmute my sexual energy, if I were to stop jerking off for a week, where would I put that energy? I guarantee you that's in Dominic's journal for sure. <laughs> sure. Somewhere. <laughs> yeah, pages. And- that's a 2017 journal, 100%. <laughs> One of the things that we've encouraged the men in our mastermind to journal about, especially with this conversation around courage, is filling in this, this sentence, what I truly desire is dot, dot, dot. We had the men write 10 answers to that question. What I truly desire in my financial life is, what I truly desire in my sex life is, what I truly desire when it comes to loving the body that I've been given is, dot, dot, dot. I have, I have no end to the, the way that you can iterate that question, but to get really clear on not a practical desire, you know, not, not, not something that's like incrementally better on what you want, but like a burning desire, you know, like I truly desire for me in my life a partner that I can build the life of my dreams with, who I am madly in love with and also have better and better sex as each year goes on. I truly desire having a partnership where we define our own terms so that it's never stagnant or boring or dull. I don't want to ever feel a sense of lack of freedom. I want to feel ultimate freedom through my relationship. So I just keep going and going and going as a part of my journaling process to get really clear on what it is I'm creating. And therefore, through that writing, I'm much more aware on a daily basis. Is that what I'm calling into my life? And am I being the man that's worthy of attracting that in my life? That is definitely also in Dominic's journal and (laughs) circa November 2020. So this is the first challenge that we're talking about that is a creative energy. So we've talked about consuming, like reading. We've talked about witnessing, like like a breathwork or a meditation. This is the first creative one that we're talking about. And what Dominic has gave you here is a prompt. Like what I really desire, what I really, really want, what I really, really desire is, that's a great one. There's all there's a multitude of prompts. There's a multitude of ways to do journaling. Something I like to start with when it comes to journaling is just writing down my emotion without any context, without any rationalization, just what am I feeling right now? It's, we also call this an emotional check-in. And I will write the very first line of every one of my journals says happy, thankful, sad, anxious, whatever it is that I'm feeling that day. The reason it's good to do that for me is to then, if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna write to the prompt of what do I really want, I know where I'm coming from. I know what state that I'm in, that I am writing what I really want. Because if we're not, if we're not pointed or aware of the direction we're going in, and we just start to create from that place of unawareness, then like we may go a hundred miles an hour in the wrong direction. So just for me, it's a quick emotional check-in. What am I feeling right now? And then what do I want from that place? What's really important about what you just said, Brian, is if you do that emotional check-in and you're feeling anxious or fear, and that's the predominant feeling, when you write your desires, those desires are going to be diluted. Those desires are going to be practical. They're going to be soft because you can't, I don't want to say all the time, but I've seen this many times where you don't allow yourself to desire fully when you're in a fearful, anxious place. We, we just saw this with the mastermind last week. We had the men write down their desires and the desires were pretty, you know, I would say fairly powerful, but they were practical. And then Mark Melvin, who's our our resident meditation teacher, yoga instructor, we just did an episode with him called Mindfulness for Men. Really great episode. Mark led us through a warrior yoga session, right? Like 30 minutes. Oh, that was awesome. Right? You remember that? Yeah. And so like you were in virtual, but the men in person, like we felt like in the room, you could feel this virtually in the room, we all felt. We felt ourselves, you know what I mean? Like we felt strong and then we revisited our desires and we looked at those desires and we're like, ah, we haven't dreamt boldly enough. So if like you do this emotional check-in and you're like, I feel powerful, then you write your desires, you will see that there's going to be an amplification. I love that. What am I feeling? Write the emotions and then do a journal prompt 
that's one of the benefits of this 31 day challenge that we're going to be doing is you're going to be getting a prompt either in a text message or an email or both, depending on what you sign up for. We're going to be giving you the journaling prompts that not just you, but every man that's going through this process will be a part of. Habit number six of a mentally tougher man is exercise and specifically an exercise challenge. So you know that Brian and I are, well, I'm more of a fan of the 100 push-up challenge than Brian is. <laughs> Brian has participated in the 100 push-up challenges. I wouldn't say at 100% capacity. No, no, like 30, 30%. <laughs> but there are these challenges that are out there, like the 75 hard challenge. If you search on like Twitter or Instagram, hashtag 75 hard, like the program is 45 minutes twice a day for 75 consecutive days. You follow like a diet that has no alcohol, very little sugars. You have to take a picture, a progress picture every single day. And you'll see these men who are just like out of weight or unhappy with their bodies radically transform in a period of 75 days. The 100 push-up challenge, which is all about like kind of pushing you to this edge of what you think your body is capable of. When I took on the challenge first time five years ago, I'd never done more than 50 consecutive push-ups in a row. The 100 push-up challenge pushed me to my edges physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually to see what I was capable of. When I transcended that 100 push-up mark, it showed me that, man, I'm much more capable than I gave myself credit for. So how could I bring that into other contexts of my life where I may have limiting beliefs? So these physical challenges, if you can make them bigger than just physical, for me, it wasn't just about this brute thing of, can I do 100 consecutive push-ups? It was, if I can make this matter spiritually, like this is a spiritual practice for me getting down every couple of days to do the work. If I could dedicate this to all the other men who have limiting beliefs in their life and show them that I could do this, so could you, and inspire them to do more, that were the things that kept me going. And so anytime I go into a big thing, like writing a book or launching a podcast or launching a mastermind or launching a digital group like the Great Man Within Podcast Facebook group, I bring in the same practices that I learn in these physical challenges that keep me going for long periods of time, even when on a daily basis, I may feel, man, this is tough. This is a baseline one, Dominic. And I say baseline because I can tell when I am in a physical state where I feel nourished, that means I've slept enough. Yeah. I've eaten the right food. I feel like I have a lot of energy. I'm not tired. All of the other things that we've been talking about, cold showers and meditation, journaling, breath work, are amplified. Yes. Like if, if my physical state is one of which I'm tired, I'm stressed out, like whatever it may be, like all of that other stuff, it matters less. It matters, but it matters less. And so there is a physical component to being mentally tougher, to have the endurance to take on these things and use the tools that we're developing. So like, yes, like there is a bigger aspect, like what you talked about with, with the 100 push-up challenge of like, do this for a bigger reason than just the brute force. And there is a value to the brute force. Of course. And that's why exercise is part of this. What I love about what you just said about is like when I'm sleeping well, when I'm eating well, when I'm doing these things well, then like I perform better in all areas of my life. That's why I love these workout challenges is when you make it so challenging, the only way you're going to get there is by focusing Focusing your eating, focusing your sleeping, focusing the time that you're like your schedule to make sure the workouts are happening. And that brings a level of intentionality that will also show up in other areas of your life. I remember one of my clients, Terry Kelly, she's been on the show too. She's senior vice president of Morgan Stanley, one of the top 10 women wealth advisors in the state of Arizona, rated by Forbes. She said that like some of her best years financially were when she was competing in Ironman competitions. She's done five of them. Because like that Iron Man, even though it requires an extraordinary amount of time and training, requires you to get so intentional about every moment that you spend and where you spend it. So it creates an elevation in all of those other areas as well. That's why I like these challenges. For us in this 31-day challenge, we're going to be doing push-ups. So I think the way we're going to start it is like, you know, on the first time we do it, like that day, you're going to do 100 push-ups. And then the next week, it's 150 push-ups. Next week, is going to be at 200 push-ups over the course of the day, not like consecutively, but for a lot of guys, that'll be more push-ups than they've ever done. Well, just so you know, Dominic, I am part of a challenge already, like right now. What is that? I'm on the 19th day of a 100 burpee challenge. Oh, shit. Yep. How's that going? I'm doing it with Andrew Walker. 
Okay. There's a buddy of mine that lives out in California. Yeah. Uh, we'll send each other videos of us of us <laughs> doing the 100 burpees, and we always make them nice and creative. But how is it going? It's going well. I ripped through 18 yesterday. That felt really good. So, But it's not like like the 100 push-up challenge, the point of the 100 push-up challenge, the brute force version of the point is like to do 100 push-ups in a row. Right. The 100 burpees is not 100 burpees in a row. It is 100 burpees like in a given day. So from one to 100. Yeah. Like that's what we're going to do with the push-ups is not 100 in a row. There's no way you're going to be able to do that in, in like that short period of time. So it's going to be 100 push-ups oh, over the course of the day. Great. And the next week will be 150 push-ups over the course Consider of the day. Consider me in, Dominic. I am in. Finally. Finally, we got Brian in on that. All these challenges between showers and push-ups. I was like, I don't know. I don't know if I'm in. But now I'm in. <laughs> Before we go to this last one, if you want to register for this challenge, you can just go to thegreatmanwithin.com. Thegreatmanwithin.com, you can Google it. It'll send you to the page where you can register for this challenge. Many of you guys have have, have gotten used to going to doinnerwork.com forward slash resources. That's also there. It's going to actually reroute you to that page, but I think it's easier for our the Choose FI guys who I've been on their show now four times. They browbeat me. They're like, you need to just put it the great man within, you know, like, just get that domain. Got it. This makes sense. So if you search it, if you Google it, if you type it in, either the great man within or greatmanwithin.com, it will reroute you to the page where you can register for this challenge. The seventh habit of a mentally tougher man is sharing. This one's not one that we've talked about before, but sharing a part of you, something that either you're working on, a vulnerable part of you with other men so that you can now start to be a model and an inspiration for them. Here are different forms that that could take. One of the more popular ones that we've heard about here is most of the guys who listen to the show are the first person in their group of friends or in their family to step outside of the matrix to do this inner work. And oftentimes you've been met with resistance from your group of friends who are like, what the fuck are you doing? What's a men's retreat? Why are you listening to me? Why are you meditating? Your family doesn't understand this stuff. They think it's weird or woo woo or they roll their eyes at you. And so it takes courage to like to go and do this on your own, it takes even greater courage to share something that you've been working on. But we found that a lot of the guys have found ways to take their group of friends deeper by saying, like revealing some insecurity that you're working on or a hardship that you've had or a breakthrough that you've had that have taken the conversations beyond just the typical beer drinking, sports conversations, you know, sex stories, to take it a layer deeper and you have shared many amazing stories with us about how your group of friends actually were craving that, but you had to be the one who went first. So sharing in that capacity is is one way you can do it. What, what's another way, Bri, that, that you think guys could share? This is by far of the, all the challenges, the hardest one, the one that's going to feel that has the most risk associated with it. Could be. It's also the most powerful one if done right. Because there is a right way to do this and there is a wrong way to do this. And I can tell you first the wrong way to do it because I've done it plenty of times. This is not advice giving. Right. Nope. This is not like, look what I learned at Dominic's immersion and, and mastermind. Like you're doing it wrong. This is also not really prompting questions. I made an awful mistake of a group of people that were very important to me to bring up a vulnerable topic around transitions. And I won't go into the details of the story, but I basically posed to the entire table. It's like, we're all going through transitions. Tell me about yours. Yeah. Right? <laughs> it wasn't all – everybody like looked at me like I was crazy. Yeah. Right? So there's a, there is a wrong way to do sharing, but the right way to do it is to, to share from your experience of something that you're going through. What this does, it's an invitation – to a conversation. And when we think about like something that I'm going through, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with, you know, hey, I'm like really trying to decide, I'm trying to balance my business life and, and, and personal life and trying to decide where I should live. And, you know, I could really use your help, right? Like, what do you think about this? You're inviting somebody in. It's scary to do. But if you think about it, if you're the other person that's hearing this, that's hearing this share, like what would your reaction be to that person, to a friend especially? Yeah. And it's a really beautiful, powerful place to be and to start with a group of guys that haven't done this before. So sharing, oh man, this is a this is a really big one. It is a big one because like other guys are looking to open up. They just don't know how to. So they need an example first. And the reason why you and I are doing this podcast is because like you started opening up about testicular cancer. I started opening up about sex addiction. And the more that we did that, we found more and more guys kind of spilling their guts 
about all the stuff that was going on in their lives. It had nothing to do with testicular cancer or sex addiction. It was just like things that they couldn't talk about anyone else. And they were like, wow, look at the, these guys like have created this space. Now I can talk about it. And and you and I saw this happen so much that we're like, okay, I guess we should probably talk more publicly about this stuff. That was the exact path that led us here. That's right. So I would say that that's one way of sharing. Another powerful way of sharing is if you've got a perspective, you know, if you've got something to say, but like you've been biting your tongue, sharing could take the form of a post on Facebook, a blog post you publish on LinkedIn about something professional or inner work related, whatever it is, and put it out there. Because I know a lot of guys have things to say, but it's what if nobody comments on it? What if it's crickets? Or what if someone criticizes me? Right. And so like you never say the thing. This could be a real opportunity to share something that's been burning inside of you. This is kind of like the shower where we're creating an environment in which that is a training ground. Yes. That this is another way to create this training ground. So like what used to be a challenge for us is now a training ground. So we can say, oh, interesting. I posted something. And by the way, this is advice giving and I'm also giving it to myself because <laughs> yeah. I have not been very good about this. But like when I post something on Instagram and like what if I don't get responses? Like, to me, that's terrifying. Yes. Which is, seems ridiculous, but it's terrifying. I get it. And if I'm taking my own advice here, isn't that interesting? Huh. Isn't that interesting that that sort of post doesn't get some sort of reaction that, that I'm, for whatever reason, looking for? And it gives me the opportunity to then say, like, what else can I do? That's right. And to help you overcome that particular fear, the sharing in that respect is not about getting the reaction. It's not about the outcome. It's not about how many people comments or like, what it really is, is like your metric is, did you have the courage to share? Did I do it? Prove to yourself. Now that that's step number one. Eventually, you're going to want to put out content that other people resonate with and you can look at the either the like the lack of feedback or the absence or, or the existence of feed, uh, the existence of engagement as your barometers for, for how to tweak it up. But the first step is, did you have the courage to actually just execute on it? And my first videos, my first blog posts were fucking garbage. Our first six or seven podcasts that you and I recorded, we trashed, like no one's ever seen them or listened to them because they were bad. But like we, we just wanted to make sure that like we did this and eventually we published and then eventually we've grown. So here we go. The seven habits again of a mentally tougher man, cold shower, meditation, breath work, reading men's work excerpts, journaling, exercise challenges, and sharing. Now, if this resonated with you, we'd love to invite you to join this 31-day challenge to start the new year of 2021. You can head over to thegreatmanwithin.com and register for that program. It's free. You can sign up for text messages, emails on a daily basis. You're going to be a part of a community of men who are doing this. We're going to be sharing all of our wins and our obstacles in the Great Man Within Facebook group. All this stuff is going to be linked in the show notes so you can register. I'm planning on starting 2021 with a bang and having 31 consecutive days of mental toughness like built into my day. There's no way that I'm going to be drifting to start the year and winning the first month of the year is going to go a long way to winning the entire year. Friday, January 1st, cold shower, 15 seconds. Here we go. See you there. All right, if you have made it this far and listened to the very end of one of our longer episodes, there's no reason why you shouldn't be joining us on the Mentally Tougher Man Challenge starting January 1st, 2021. Head to thegreatmanwithin.com or just go to the show notes where the link is there right at the top of the show notes. Click on it, register for the 31-day challenge, and then join the Facebook group, The Great Man Within Podcast, which is also in the show notes so that you can see other men and be supported on your journey and share your wins. We will see you January 1st.